At this time, would all sergeants please start their recordings? <clears throat> Computer recording started. Thank you. Live recording started. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Hospitals. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you would like to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Rivera, we're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well, all things considered. So good morning, my name is Carlina Rivera and I am chair of the Committee on Hospitals. I'd like to start by thanking all of you who have joined us for this remote hearing. We are here today to examine the city's support of hospitals during the COVID pandemic with a focus on the support provided during the spring. There is no easy way to recap what the spring was like for those of us in New York City. Our city experienced an incredible amount of trauma, thousands of deaths, immense levels of fear and panic, loss of work, and an unprecedented shutdown of most of the city. Our healthcare system was pushed and stretched in unimaginable ways. It is incredible to think that just a few months ago, New Yorkers were applauding our frontline workers every night. Just give me one moment. Thank you for your patience. This is the new normal. I know that our city leaders, hospital staff, and essential workers were working around the clock to protect and save the lives of New Yorkers. And while the worst of the spring is over for now, we know the work has not ended. So I wanna start by acknowledging this and using this reminder to help frame our discussion today. Thank you to everyone present who was working during the spring, including Dr. Katz and Health and Hospitals, representatives of other hospitals, as well as Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the New York City Department of Emergency Management for their work. I want to especially thank h and and DOHMH for their hard work, which they managed to do while simultaneously keeping myself, the council, and the city informed and updated on COVID-19 and how to stay safe. Your presence here today and continued collaboration is very much appreciated. Now that we've fortunately had some months of the easing of restrictions, significantly less hospitalizations, more availability of testing and supplies, and generally a more relaxed city, we want to know exactly what it takes to support our city's hospitals during the pandemic. City agencies coordinated a massive amount of PPE and other medical supplies production and distribution oversaw and assisted with the dramatic increase in the city's hospital capacity and staffing and provided countless public health messages to New Yorkers. We acknowledge that it is extremely impressive the amount of effort that went into these actions. And today we wanna to discuss that work as well as the concerns raised during the peak and afterwards. For example, we are aware of hurdles faced by healthcare workers looking to help during March and April, issues with patient transfers, concerns regarding access to PPE, and long-term implications of people being unable to access non-COVID-related care during the spring. We also know that this pandemic has and continues to disproportionately impact Black and Latino New Yorkers, as well as other traditionally marginalized populations. This shouldn't come as a surprise to us because of our society's pervasive perpetuation of systemic racism. Our healthcare system is no different. Our public hospital system and other safety net hospitals have faced long-standing inequities themselves. They are underfunded and they are under-resourced. They are located in the city's hardest hit communities, including those home to the city's most diverse residents and serve those who are underinsured and uninsured. 
Our public hospitals were the busiest in the city because they serve communities impacted by systemic inequities and because they themselves experience funding inequities. They did everything in their power to serve New Yorkers and they frankly should not have needed to fight so much to meet the needs of their patients. This pandemic proves that our healthcare system is too disparate, not just in times of crisis, but year round. Our public and safety net hospitals require the most attention and support. And we want to ensure the city did all it possibly could to prioritize their needs. We are committed to ensuring that the path we build forward out of this pandemic is more equitable for all. Thank you again for attending today. And I want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who have already joined us. I see Council Member Moya, Ayala, Levine, Maisel, that's all I see for now and I'm sure we'll be joined by others as the time goes on. And with that I want to turn it over to our uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Ahuja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Hospitals at the New York City Council. Before we begin, I will be going over some procedural items. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. As a reminder, all hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration followed by council member questions and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Dr. Mitchell Katz, President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals and Deanne Criswell, Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Jackie Bray, Deputy Executive Director of the New York City Test and Trace Corps, and Maura Kennelly, Associate Commissioner of External Affairs for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Before we begin, I will be administering the oath. Dr. Mitchell Katz, Commissioner Deanne Criswell, Deputy Executive, exec, excuse me, Deputy Executive Director Jackie Bray, Associate Commissioner Maura Kennelly, Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Katz? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Criswell? I do. Thank you. Um, Deputy Executive Director Jackie Bray? I do. Thank you. And Associate Commissioner Maura Kennelly? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Criswell, Criswell, excuse me, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I am Commissioner Deanne Criswell, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of New York City Emergency Management. I am joined today by Dr. Mitchell Katz, the President and Chief Executive Officer of New York City Health and Hospitals, Maura Kennelly, Associate Commissioner for External Affairs at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Deputy Executive Director Jackie Bray, Deputy Executive Director of the New York City Test and Trace Corps. While New York City Emergency Management has been actively involved in citywide coordination and multiple operations across the city, state, and federal landscape for COVID-19, I will focus today on items related to our work within the city's public hospital system. As cases quickly spread across the globe in early 2020, New York City Emergency Management started to prepare for the inevitable, COVID-19 in New York City. Emergency Management activated the city's Emergency Operations Center on February 1st to implement the federal quarantine directives 
and built a structure of interagency crisis action planning task forces to rapidly develop policies, procedures, and recommendations. Tasks and responsibilities of the agency evolved to meet the needs of the emergency as we worked on massive operations, including emergency food delivery, healthcare infrastructure capacity, quarantine and isolation hotel operations, continuity of operations, and fatality management. One of the first priorities was to operationalize and expand the city's capability to treat the rapidly increasing number of patients. This included operations to coordinate medical surge space, medical surge staffing, and the procurement of critical medical supplies, including personal protective equipment. With assistance from our city agency partners, New York State and the federal government, we stood up temporary hospital facilities in non-traditional settings to care for patient surge if hospital capacity became overwhelmed. This included the Jacob Javits Center in Manhattan, the USNS Comfort Naval Hospital Ship, the Billie Jean King Tennis Facility in Queens, and the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. Additionally, New York City Emergency Management worked with our hospital partners to expand the number of readily available ICU beds in existing facilities in a number of institutions, including the Brooklyn Center for Rehabilitation, the Borough Park Center for Rehabilitation and Nursing, North Central Bronx Hospital, and Kohler Hospital. This process provided emergency management with invaluable experience and information about how to prepare for a second wave in future pandemics. New York City Emergency Management also sourced and entered into emergency contracts with health, healthcare staffing firms that brought thousands of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals to the bedsides of New Yorkers. We set up a staffing cell that rapidly placed volunteers into hospitals and worked with airline partners to fly them in for free. We also coordinated the request and placement of medical providers from the United States Armed Forces who provided care in all of our public hospitals. Additionally, we coordinated the Medical Reserve Corps operation where medical volunteers were accepted and matched to appropriate facilities in need. In conjunction with these efforts, we issued a wireless emergency alert aimed at recruiting more healthcare workers to aid in the response. In total, over 5,600 volunteer and contract staff were placed in healthcare institutions. Emergency management also worked with our city partners to help procure critical medical supplies for healthcare facilities through our logistics center. In consultation with the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene and the public and private hospital systems, we facilitated the delivery of supplies to facilities in a coordinated fashion and with special attention to particular facility needs ultimately delivering more than 22 million pieces of PPE. Additionally, we worked with the Office of Management and Budget, Department of Design and Construction, the Economic Development Council, and numerous other agencies to put in place contracts and vet potential suppliers during a time of dire need. Throughout this pandemic, the city has also been keenly aware of the crucial need to share up-to-date information with New Yorkers, especially as guidance and protocols changed as the virus and the city's response evolved. The Notify NYC team launched a short code messaging program to ensure New Yorkers received critical updates about COVID-19. More than 840,000 individuals subscribed to these messages for English and more than 31,000 for Spanish, which represents the first time emergency management used this to send text message alerts via Spanish. We translated the Notify NYC messages into traditional or simplified Chinese and issued several wireless emergency alerts in English and Spanish to all New York City cell phones. One of our goals as we move forward is to work with our messaging platform and cell service providers to be able to issue these real-time alerts in additional languages, just as the general Notify NYC program currently provides messages in 13 languages and American Sign Language. As the world continues to fight this pandemic, we are reminded that while this is a time of uncertainty, we are in this together and we never stop planning, we never stop preparing, and we never stop responding. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Dr. Katz, you may begin your testimony when you are ready.
Thank you very much. And I wanna uh, thank Chair Rivera for having this hearing uh, and particularly to her for recognizing uh, the trauma. And I appreciated that she used that word um, because the events of March and April really were traumatic for the amazing staff of Health and Hospitals. Uh, we lost a lot of loved um, staff during that time. People worked through the most difficult conditions, worrying about their own health, worrying that they might bring home illness to their loved ones. They worked incredible hours. Um, they worked under incredibly stressful conditions. They often took care of their own colleagues. Nurses took care of sick nurses. Doctors took care of sick doctors. I mean, you can imagine how strong the empathy would have been, how challenging it would have been. Um, and also, I think, underappreciated who did most of that work, women, right? People don't always recognize that. But there was, there was a brilliant article done on the women of Elmhurst. Um, recognizing that three fourths of the people who work at Elmhurst, the epicenter of the epicenter were women, uh, starting with the chief medical officer, Dr. Jasmine Mashapur, an immigrant herself, who has spent 50 years uh, working at Elmhurst. And those are the people who struggle to keep everyone alive despite the incredibly difficult circumstances of COVID. Um, we did our best. I thought uh, Chair Rivera got it right. Um, it was awful, but people did their best. Um, we started preparing as soon as we heard about uh, what was going on in Wuhan. We opened up our emergency center. We canceled elective surgeries so that we would have more staff. We converted our routine face-to-face -face visits to televisits uh, to protect people from having to go out uh, and potentially uh, expose themselves. Um, we did the most massive increase in ICU creation that probably has ever been done in this country. And if you uh, if you asked me as someone who spent his career in public hospitals, Mitch, how long do you think it would take you to triple your ICU capacity? I would have said, oh, I don't know, maybe two years, three years it would take you know, something like that. You'd have to get the equipment and the staffing and the space. Well, we did that in six weeks. We went from having no COVID patients on March uh, 1 to having almost 4,000 by mid-April. We went from having uh, zero uh, intubated COVID patients to having 960 uh, COVID patients uh, in our facilities. Um, I read sometimes the newspaper articles about other areas of the country and I, I feel sympathetic, but they usually talk about how they're about to uh, reach capacity of, of their ICUs and they don't know what they're gonna do when they reach capacity. And I can't help thinking, oh my God, we reach capacity by week one. Capacity wasn't the issue. The issue was how quickly can we create new ICU beds and of course, the, the most important um, element in creating um, the beds are the people. And again, you know, I think that was one of the enduring lessons of COVID and something I think about a lot in terms of how you go forward. In the end, space was not the issue. The issue was people, having enough doctors, enough nurses, enough respiratory therapists, and getting them through these incredible traumatic times. Uh, but I, I think that uh, we did uh, as well as one could possibly have done. In terms of the alternative uh, sites, the one that worked best for us was the RIMC, um, the Roosevelt Island Medical Center, which we stood up and have now closed down. Um, it was able to take patients who would have gone home if they had a home. Um, but because they didn't have a home or their home was a multi-generational -gener family or their home would, wouldn't be able to provide them enough support services, we were able to care for them at RIMC once they were no longer acutely ill. Uh, we did a lot of transfers. Um, I want to thank uh, the board and the mayor. Uh, for maintaining a robust public hospital system. All, the city 
you know, deserves tremendous credit. I, I've only had the privilege of being back here for three years, but it's because of all of you that there are 11 public hospitals in New York City, remembering that Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Milwaukee, Sacramento, San Diego, all of these places used to have public hospitals and they don't have any. And the thing that ultimately saved us um, was that we had 11. So with Central Queens so affected and as Chair Rivera said, people came to us because they trusted us because they knew that Elmhurst was a safe place to go where you wouldn't be reported to the federal authorities, where you wouldn't be sent a bill, where people would speak your language, where people would treat you with dignity. So they came to us. Um, but in order to be able to serve people, we transferred patients, almost 900 across our 11 facilities. And places like North Central Bronx um, were amazing. Um, and I still remember the, going to visit there and who was taking care of our patients? The midwives, the midwives of NCB, you know, stood up to take care of the ICU patients um, who needed their care, who were coming from Queens. Um, but everybody stood up in order to take care of our patients um, the way they needed to take care of. We added 5,000 nurses, 1,500 other health practitioners, um, they came mostly from tempor temporary agency staffing that we used. People came from around the country. We got great support from the Department of Defense. Um, and people asked me, you know, was there any culture, you know, uh, uh, problems? And there was zero. You know, people, the people who showed up, showed up to, to do a mission. Um, and whether they were, you know, a... Uh, nurse uh, civilian, or they were a nurse from the army, people really responded. Um, we did a lot of work with helping healers heal. We're still doing that. I do believe that there are a number of my staff who have post-traumatic stress syndrome, who feel really hurt uh, because what, what, is, what is it that they feel hurt about? They feel that they would have liked to have done more for their patients. And I know as a, as a practicing physician, that's a terrible feeling. You always wanna feel that whatever happened to your patient, you did everything that you could have done to help them. But of course, when people had loads of patients um, that were three times larger um, than the normal load, they did their best, they saved lives, but I know a number of people still you know, lose sleep, wake up in the middle of the night, uh, feeling, you know, upset, uh, traumatized that they wish that they could have done more. Um, certainly the city, and I, I thank Deanne, I thank Jackie Bray, I was with them, you know, 11 p.m. at night as we're talking about, you know, sending planes to go get more uh, PPE, you know, who knows how to make gowns, what, what could be a way of making gowns, uh, to protect my workers. They worked so hard to try to get us um, the supplies. And in the end, we, we never ran out, although we came perilous, perilously close to running out multiple times, but we never did. Um, often at those hours, I was moving around uh, with my staff ventilators from one place to another to be sure that we always had just enough. And we always had just enough. It wasn't, uh, and I think this hasn't always been understood, part of the challenge for the PPE, especially the N95 masks, was when you train people to use N95 masks, you train them, okay, you go into the room, you see your patient with the infectious disease, you go out of the room, you throw away the N95 mask. That's how we train people. That's what life is supposed to be like. But of course, that wasn't what life was like. Um, and frankly, people were taking care of whole wards of people with COVID. So there wasn't any great value in taking off their mask. It would have only exposed them. But I, I say that to help explain why it was that even though we, we didn't run out, people were justifiably upset. They were looking at, well, uh, but the supplies will never last. Uh, so imagine you're, you're at work today 
and you know that there's a mask for you today, but there's not enough masks for you tomorrow, you know, and you're thinking about coming to work tomorrow. We, we did a lot of just in time um, uh, supplies. That's what we had to do. And I'm just so grateful to the other people uh, to make sure that um, we didn't run out. Uh, we did a lot of outpatient work. We answered uh, 80,000 calls, multilingual, real doctors telling people what to do so that they were able to get through um, the time at home without coming to the hospital unless they absolutely had to. So I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion, to, to your questions, Chair Rivera, and the, and the questions of your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Rivera. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Rivera, please be. Thank you so much. And thank you for your testimony. Um, of course, I, it, it is very much appreciated. And I just wanna say for, um, appreciate you acknowledging just all the people that we've lost and there are many people behind the scenes right now that are part of the council who lost family members and friends. And I, um, you know, as they participate in this hearing and make it happen, I, I just want to acknowledge all of their loss as well. Um, Dr. Katz, so commissioners, I, I, I want to thank you again for being here. I know that your time is very, very precious. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. So I will try to go as quickly as I can through these questions and see if my colleagues have any as well. So we heard a lot about PPE, of course. I think uh, that was that kind of distribution, medical equipment access and availability is probably the most important, one of the most important topics in terms of what we saw in the news as being very, very limited. Um, you talked a little bit about redistributing it, never quite being out of PPE. And then of course, some of the stories that we saw as to whether staff really did indeed have everything they need in unprecedented times. So in terms of PPE distribution, by April 1st, DOHMH had distributed over 1 million N95 respirators, millions of face masks, and tens of thousands of gloves, gowns, and face shields from the city, state, and federal stockpiles and private donations to the city's hospitals, nursing homes, and emergency medical services. How did the city develop its PPE distribution process? How was PPE distribution determined? And how did you work with hospitals outside of the health and hospital system to make sure that there was an equitable distribution, if that indeed happened? I think we're gonna have Jackie uh, address it since she spent many a long night working on, on that distribution. Jackie? Jackie was just here. I saw her little box. Are you on mute? Deanne, do you wanna start until Jackie yeah. restores? She's, she's, she's logging in, it happened. Okay. <laughs> We're working on universal broadband for all. <laughs> Great initiative. She's just connect. Her audio is connecting. So uh, Jackie, I, I think you might have missed some of the conversation. We're going to unmute you. And if you want me to repeat the question, I'm, I'm happy to do that. It's not a problem. You just have to unmute the deputy. Jackie, do you want me to repeat I'm, the question? I'm sorry. Yes. Please it's do. Okay. I'm sorry it's, about that. It's, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. I'm just glad that you're here. So my question is about PPE distribution. Okay. Um, I mentioned over a million N95 respirators, face masks, gloves, gowns, face shields, 
all, all of those stockpiles, the private donations to the city's hospitals, nursing homes, and emergency medical services? How did the city develop its PPE distribution process? How is PPE distribution determined? And how did that work with hospitals outside of health and hospital system, mm -hmm. if that sort of coordination did indeed happen at all? Sure, of course. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. The city had really two ways of distributing PPE um, throughout March and April and into May. Um, the first is that at any time, any healthcare facility could make an emergency request through the NISM, the New York City Office of Emergency Management uh, Logistics Center. And those emergency requests by and large were fulfilled within 24 hours, uh, assuming that we had whatever the request was for on hand. But as the hospital census, census began to increase uh, in early March, uh, the city made the decision, the Department of Health and um, Mental Hygiene made the decision to begin pushes of PPE. So instead of waiting for hospitals to request what they needed on an emergency basis, uh, DOHMH began to push out twice a week, uh, um, uh, you know, stocks of PPE to 55 hospitals across the city. H&H uh, &H were 11 of those 55, um, but we were supplying twice a week every week by mid-March um, all the city's hospitals, all the hospitals in the city, both independent and the big five systems. Um, and we made decisions about how much to allocate to each um, hospital based on the number of admitted COVID patients they had and based on the volume that their emergency departments, their emergency rooms were experiencing of COVID patients. And those decisions were made in partnership between the Department of Health, H&H, &H, Greater New York Hospital Association, the city and the state. And could you confirm that the health and hospitals were, were probably the, the hospitals that needed the most PPE considering your criteria for how they were distributed with the admitted patients, with the census that, that, you're, that you mentioned? You know, 55 hospitals, some of them are in very, very different conditions in terms of their mm -hmm. financial support, mm -hmm terms of the, 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 the wealth of the neighborhoods that they are in. So how did you ensure that you were really being as proactive and as reactive as possible to some of our hardest hit within those neighborhoods? Yeah, um, so, so we, we always made sure that health and hospitals had what they need, needed. That was our, certainly our top priority. Uh, and, and I spent, we spent as a team uh, between the Department of Health and myself and um, the, the supply chain team that is working for Dr. Katz many hours every day on the phone, ensuring that health and hospitals had what, had what they needed. Um, the city took a specific look to make sure that both the public hospitals and the independent hospitals, the smaller community-based hospitals had what they needed. Uh, and we stayed in very close touch with the big systems in greater New York to ensure that they were okay. Um, so, so I would say that, yes, we prioritized making sure that our independent hospitals and our public hospitals had what they needed, but really throughout March and April, we were supplying um, all 55 hospitals that were seeing COVID patients. So in the spring, there was an international shortage of PPE and the assistance that New York City received from the federal administration clearly was not enough. I think we continue to be um, shorted, but the city mobilized to create its own PPE. We saw a little bit of, of that of the local manufacturing, some of the locations in the city. Does the city have the capacity to manufacture most or all of its own PPE? Um, the city, the, yeah, go for it, for sure. No, no, Jackie, um, I want you to answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, the city, you know, EDC, and I, and I believe that EDC testified either last week or a couple weeks ago, too, on this topic. The Economic Development Corporation here in the city stepped up from day one uh, and began to do both an analysis of supply chain and analysis of what we could manufacture here in the city. Um, what we learned is that some 
things we could manufacture. Uh, for example, face shields. We by by mid April, the city was making enough face shields to supply our entire burn rate right here in the city. Some things were much much harder. The city never attempted, uh, could never manufacture N95s uh, within uh, within the city. And so um, there was a real analysis done. What what we could manufacture here, we were um, manufacturing here. Um, but some things take a, a, a much longer, much more infrastructure to set up, uh, and that wasn't realistic to get off the ground in March and April. Uh, by the end of April, by early May, the supplies were coming back. Um, and so we were really working. We kept saying we were working multiple strategies. We were going to buy, right? So we were going to buy. We were going to build ourselves. And if we had to, we were going to borrow. And we were always working all three of those strategies at the same time throughout the spring. So what's the city's current PPE stockpile compared to February 2020? And what interagency coordination is in place to ensure that appropriate stock, uh, to ensure appropriate stockpiles and allocation? I'll start for health and hospitals and ask Jackie or Deanne to say for the whole city. Uh, for us, uh, we have a three month reserve. So, and that's very different. Uh, like most hospital systems um, in February, we would have had, you know, a week or two in the way of reserve because we always assumed that we would just keep buying. And we had, as uh, the chair, you had pointed out, the, the worldwide collapse of the supply chain took everybody su by surprise. When we read about Wuhan, we just as a hospital system put in orders for all the PPE um, that we would have needed to get through the crisis. And the orders were accepted. No one said in January, oh, we, you know, you'll never get these. It was only that when March and April came, those shipments never arrived. Um, and that's why I, the wisdom of maintaining um, a reserve. So aside from all whatever reserves the city is holding, we're holding three months of supply for ourselves. Uh, Jackie or, or Deanne, I don't know which of you knows best the city cache. Um, I can start on that, Jackie, and if I miss anything, please feel free to chime in. So sure. the city since then has now developed um, what we're calling a PPE service center. Um, and so we have hired a vendor to manage this for us. And so each hospital, um, even outside of the health and hospital system, our, syst our hospital systems and the independents all have their own 90 day supply of PPE. And then through our PPE service center, we have an additional 90 day supply of PPE um, that can be utilized. Um, I am also, as part of emergency management, monitoring what the state stockpiles are, as well as the strategic national stockpile. Um, but I think where we are at right now with the hospital systems, as well as the city's service center, uh, we are in much better shape than we were in the spring. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I want to move on to just ventilators. Um, in early April, the city supply of ventilators was in a state of crisis. The mayor estimated that the city needed an additional 2,500 to 3,000 more ventilators, and there was a possibility that we would run out. Governor Cuomo announced the same day that he was authorizing the state's National Guard to seize ventilators from less overwhelmed hospital so they could be used at hospitals that had a more urgent need. How was the city ensuring that each hospital was supplied with the ventilators that it needed? Again, I'll start, and I know Jackie did a lot of work. We did a lot of work together on ventilators. Um, those I saw, remember seeing those um, projections, and they, you know, drove a knife through my heart at the time because it was impossible to imagine how we would have met that need. Uh, fortunately, the projections were wrong, um, and uh, the great efforts of New Yorkers to flatten the curve worked. Um, and the number of cases leveled off. Um, so we, we never had that, that huge crisis that, that we would have imagined. We did come very close though. I mean, we, we were on the few days only. And I know in my own system, 
part of why I kept having to move ventilators was that I had to match ventilators to demand um, uh, so that it, it was often, you know, that close where someone, a hospital, if they were hit very hard on a particular night, harder than I had estimated, I would need to move right away enough ventilators uh, for them to be able to, to make it through. I, I would say before going to Jackie, um, one fortunate thing that we've now learned is that many patients are better off on BPAP or CPAP, which are forms of non-invasive ventilation that don't require that you have an intubation tube down your throat. It's instead that you wear a mask that at high pressure pushes air into you. Um, and it has turned out, uh, as we've learned more and more, that there are a large group of patients who do better um, with that care. That wasn't standard. That's one of the, the things that explains why the death rate across the country has gone down. We're getting better at, at treating this illness. But, but those days of worrying uh, about enough ventilators for the next day were just horrible. Jackie, we did that. We worked those nights together. Uh, what can you say about the rest of the city supply? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so no hospital across the city ever ran out of a ventilator. But as Dr. Katz says, we got close. Um, and they were harrowing days and harrowing nights. Um, the, the city for ventilator supply, I should say that um, David Starr, who's the Assistant Commissioner of Emergency Field Operations for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, is one of the real unsung heroes of the March and April response. Um, we had a number of emergency requests come in for ventilators for hospitals across the city. We were able to fulfill them all. Uh, we were working on a very small number of ventilators the city ourselves were able to buy, plus the, um, an allotment from the state and an allotment from FEMA. At some point, FEMA delivered about 2,500 ventilators uh, that we were able to push out across um, city hospitals to both H&H &H and the independent hospitals and some of the big five systems. Uh, and then, of course, we held on to a couple to meet emergency requests. Um, I think that one thing to remember, which can be hard looking back on those days, is that we were working on planning assumptions that we had created in mid-March and late March as the, as the curve was go as a sort of we were climbing that mountain. And because of the way the mitigation measures work, they take 14 days for you to see it in the cases. And it can take even an extra week or two to see it in the hospitalizations. And so we were watching, you know, you needed to deploy another 200 ventilators a night or 300 ventilators a night. We were watching the city's um, numbers go up like that, hoping, knowing, thinking, that we had done the right thing two, three weeks prior where it was gonna break. But we never knew until it broke, we didn't know what day it was gonna break. Um, and so that, that's sort of the dynamic we were in in that first, uh, first week of April, uh, sort of second week of April. Thank you. I wanna just ask a few more questions. I see at least one of my uh, colleagues also has questions. So let me jump to alternative care sites. H&H &H and the New York City Department of Emergency Management coordinated the opening of large alternate care sites, including the Javits Center in Manhattan, the Billie Jean King Tennis Facility in Queens and the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. We also had help from the USNS Comfort and we'll talk about whether that was helpful or not and a 350 bed field hospital at the Roosevelt Island Medical Center in total how many patients were transferred to these alternative care sites? And of the patients transferred, how many were from H&H? &H? How many were from voluntary hospitals? And, and yeah, I- Andy, Yeah, sure. Well, I, I just wanted, just really quick. Um, I, I, we've heard that the sites could have been more successful if they had accepted COVID patients in need of higher levels of care as soon as they were opened. Why was that not possible? Yeah, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, 
So on the, the exact number of patients that were transferred, uh, we'll, we'll have to get back to you on the number because I don't hold, have those right in front of me. Um, but what it's important to discuss is the point that you just raised. And when we first started to develop these alternate care facilities and specifically the Jacob Javits Center and the US Naval Ship Comfort, those two, the Jacob Javits Center was uh, run by the state in coordination with the city, but staffed by the Department of Defense. And then the USNS Comfort was a purely um, um, federal asset that was run by them. And their initial planning assumptions uh, that they had put in place when they were building those two or building the one site and bringing in the Comfort was that they were gonna treat non-COVID patients so they could take the pressure off the hospital system to treat more COVID patients. And while in theory, that sounds like it would have worked really well, what we found was that across all of our hospitals, there just weren't that many non-COVID patients. And so it took several days of conversations with um, leaders at the highest level of the Department of Defense and myself to really talk through what it was we needed here in the city and we eventually were able to change um, their planning assumption to be able to treat COVID positive patients. Um, but we still ran into some struggles with that and the fact that they still didn't have the capability to treat those that were the most sick, which is really what we were seeing across the hospitals as well. And they were able to treat those lower acuity patients. And so we did have a hard time getting patients from the hospitals into these centers. Um, what I would say though, and, and Mitch can talk more about why we couldn't send so many low acuity patients there. What I would say is as we were building these um, and really to what Jack said a little bit earlier, we didn't know how bad bad was going to get. And so these facilities really gave us that resource that was available to be used. What we did find at the end of the day was that patients were better off treated in the hospitals than in these alternate care centers. And so once we reached that point where we knew we had enough capacity and space at the hospitals, we did another shift. And that was to take all of the, not all, but a lot of the medical personnel that were staffing the Javits Center as well as the Comfort and moved them directly into the hospitals to support the hospitals. And they went just to the public hospitals and they went to all of them. And they stood up their own wards to be able to increase the capacity um, of patient care in the, in the public hospital system. And so what we learned was while well, we went through a lot and it takes a lot of time to, to put those up, we did discover that our hospital system has enough capacity. And at the end of the day, it's really staff that's needed to maximize the capacity that we have. Uh, Mitch, do you want to just talk a little bit about why we couldn't take the, the most critical over to those locations? Right. Um, I think that the lesson is hospitals are very specialized facilities and you can't just stand up a hospital, you know, in a non-hospital space and expect it to care for intubated, ventilated ICU patients. There's just too much that you need in equipment, in pharmaceuticals, in respiratory therapists, in uh, ICU nurses, in a variety of x-rays, um, and that um, the idea of offloading um, wasn't the, the hospitals, and again, I remember these days very well, the, the hospitals were so busy keeping critically uh, ill people alive that transferring mildly ill patients just wasn't a priority. It just, the amount of effort to move a mildly um, symptomatic person wasn't worth it because we were, you know, putting all our effort into saving people's lives and the people who were mildly ill were doing okay. Um, and so there just wasn't the, the, the need. And as Deanne said, of course, if those initial projections were right, I mean, I still wonder how we would have ever staffed all of those places, um, but, but we would have needed space if we had gotten that, that full and happily um, New Yorkers efforts uh, flatten the curve before that was necessary. So just, just a couple more questions and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. According to an investigation, you know, we're talking about patient transfer. So I wanna ask a little bit about equity. According to an investigation by the Wall Street Journal, the city struggled to receive assistance from the state to set up a centralized hub to implement patient transfers 
what exactly happened there? And I ask because there is always a question of health equity. I mentioned this in my opening remarks. During the Committee on Oversight and Investigations hearing this past April, over 40 expert panelists and community advocates highlighted that communities of color are experiencing higher fatality rates from COVID-19 due to systemic racism, and that this racism is evident through economic health and societal practices that have taken place for decades. So how did the administration take health equity related issues into account when it began to put together its virus response? And to go back to my first question, when trying to develop a hub so that way patients could be transferred and receive equitable care, what happened with assistance from the state to ensure that that equity became a reality? Uh, though ultimately I will say, um, we clearly lost more black and brown New Yorkers than, than any other kind of New Yorker, which is incredibly tragic. But if you could just address how well, you did I'll, I'll that, start. Then you do better. Thank you. I'll start. Well, well first, again, I, I think you captured it, Chair. I mean, we didn't succeed in equity. We failed in equity uh, because a disproportionate number of black and brown people died. Um, they died, I mean, I think, uh, since we haven't talked about it, they, they were much more likely to get infected because they were the essential workers. They were the people who ran our trains, who stocked our grocery shelves, who worked as, as home aides. They were living in multi-generational families. They were you know, married or had parents who were essential workers. Uh, and so they got exposed a lot more. And then we know that people who are black and brown because of systemic racism live in a state of chronic stress, which is bad for your health. They're more likely to have hypertension and diabetes. They're more likely not to have good nutrition. So, I mean, the deck was stacked against people uh, and we did not succeed in achieving equity, um, which I think is shameful. We did do our best to transfer patients and I think there's also a lesson to be learned here, right? And uh, Chair Rivera, you've made this point before. Uh, if you compare the number of hospitals that Manhattan has to the number of hospitals in Queens, right? It's striking, right? I mean, part of why Elmhurst was so overwhelmed is because there aren't other hospitals in Queens. Um, and um, transfers were a very, very imperfect solution. Uh, and the reason I say that is that it's hard medically to transfer a unstable patient. Um, and so as much as we wanted to, to even things out among our 11 hospitals, which was our focus, it wasn't always easy because you can't put a patient into an ambulance to go to a less crowded hospital if you think they're about to go into cardiac arrest from lack of sufficient oxygen. Um, and you can't, while the EMTs are phenomenal, they can't adjust ventilator settings. Um, and so, you know, the problem we had, which is a little bit like the, the issue that we were discussing with the temporary uh, settings, we could have always transferred many more of the stable patients, but they weren't the ones who were causing us the, the heartache. And then the patients we most wanted to transfer um, because that's where we were overrun were so critically ill that it often was difficult to transfer them without risking their lives. Um, and so this, the state did become involved. I think uh, toward, you know, it was you know, maybe around you know, April 1, we did do some transfers. Uh, because of the state, we accepted uh, hospitalized patients from two independent systems, which again, you know, I give a lot of credit to this board and this mayor for maintaining a robust enough public system that we could help out the independents. Um, but uh, we did not have an equitable system for transferring across uh, the hospital systems that it was tried, but it, it came too late without enough uh, process before it. Deanne, is there, there are things I missed? 
I think Chair Rivera to speak directly to the question about the, um, the ask from the state. Uh, we have what is called the uh, Hurricane Evacuation Center um, capability that we use when we uh, have a pending coastal storm. And it's used, it's a tool, it's a, it's a resource, a, a, um, a web-based application that is used to evacuate hospitals that are in the way of a hurricane um, to bed match them with the patient needs. And so what we had asked was to modify that and use that system to help manage the, what we were expecting to be a growing need for transferring patients um, across hospital systems. Um, I think as, as Dr. Katz had mentioned, transferring between hospital systems is something that they do on a normal basis, but uh, across hospital systems um, is a little bit more difficult. And so that's the system that we were trying, this HEC system that we were trying to put in place uh, to support the, the anticipated need for patient transfers. Um, they never did activate it the way we had asked, but they did put a modified version in place. And what it was used for was um, to transfer patients out of hospitals and then into these alternate care facilities that were managed by the state. What emergency management did was also then create a transportation branch specifically. And um, that is the, the group of individuals that when we did have the need to, to transfer patients from some of the independents on an emergency basis, which we had a couple of times, we were able to have that branch, that transportation branch, work with each of the different hospitals to identify the places that we could move patients. And so we supported uh, the work that Dr. Katz had mentioned, as well as some of the needs across the other hospitals through this branch. Well, thank you. I, I just want to thank you for all the work that you did. I, I realize, you know, we also could have used a lot of help from the federal government that we did not receive and that continues. So that kind of agency, city and state coordination was critical and, and clearly there are many, many lessons learned. Um, I just you know, hope that hospitals, regardless of whether they're public or voluntary, that we could work more seamlessly in the future. Uh, so we don't see as much inequity as we did during the pandemic. And I, I want to commend you also for your work, I, I, because just for one, one very small example, it was the, the COVID helpline and the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers that you responded to when they called in. You, you did that on your own, Health and Hospitals did, along with the support from some of your agency colleagues. And I wanna thank you for that. That was critical in answering questions and making sure that people stood out of the hospital if they could stay home and recover safely. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you for answering my questions. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to committee council, though I know, I think council member Levine is first in the stack. Thanks, Chair. I'm now gonna be calling on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Um, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. First, we'll turn to Council Member Levine. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Chair Rivera, for your great work today and your leadership throughout this crisis. And I want to echo your words about how critical our H&H &H system has been over this pandemic, I don't even want to think about what it would have been like to go through this without the 11 acute, acute care hospitals that we have in our public system and the amazing, amazing nurses, doctors, um, techs, frontline staff, uh, the administrative folks that, um, that undoubtedly saved countless lives during this very difficult time and continue to, and we continue to rely on you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jackie Bray, whose, whose leadership has now spanned two different phases of, of the pandemic and, and two very critical portfolios. And, 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 and lastly, a, a shout out to what I think are some un, unsung heroes, which are the DOHMH uh, warehouse staff. Uh, I know that Assistant Commissioner Dave Starr is here, but uh, you guys have done a lot of round the clock work um, to help keep our supply chain going and uh, that by necessity has to be done out of sight. I mean, there actually are security reasons for that. Um, 
but, uh, but we're grateful for your efforts. Uh, I, I want to start by asking about reports we're seeing about yet again, eight months into this pandemic, a national shortage of particularly N95 masks. It, it's just insane that um, the federal government hasn't got it together on this, but with cases surging in a lot of other states, since the demand is really high, apparently there are uh, very short stockpiles in um, some of the most affected states now, uh, from uh, Michigan, uh, I've seen particular reports uh, where stockpiles in hospitals are one week or less. And it, it seems like what the federal government is doing now is prioritizing distribution uh, away from places like New York, which are trying to build up the stockpile as we have to um, towards states which are in, in crisis right now. And so I wonder, uh, I'm not sure if that would be a question uh, um, for, uh, for you, Dr. Katz, um, but are we impacted by national supply chain problems? Are we competing with other states? Uh, and in that, in, in, with that context, how secure are you feeling about our supply at this point? I feel good about the H and H supply because we put in orders and they, they keep rolling in. So I'm I, I'm not particularly worried about H and H, but I think you raise a great question, and and I, I I'm interested in what Deanne you're seeing across the system. Uh, thank you, Mitch. So as these states are now starting to see peak levels, like we saw in the early days of uh, this pandemic. I think they're going through some of the same learning curves that we went through on how best to utilize their scarce supplies that they had. Um, and that's just purely an assumption, um, in my opinion. Uh, but I think from where New York City stands right now with the PPE service center that we've put in place and the vendor that we have hired, um, we've done a lot of work for, again, all of the hospitals have built their own supplies and the city has built a 90 day supply as well. But the vendor has also been able to diversify where we are getting our PPE from. And so we're not limited as much as we were in the beginning by just having one source for obtaining PPE, which will put us in a better position um, if we do start to use it at the levels we were before and have to continue to replace it. And so we are in a much better place than we were then. Um, and it's, it's sad to hear that some of the other states are having to go through this now. Um, but I think, you know, by having this diversification and this new PPE service center, it, it sets us up well for um, the continued rise that we're starting to see. Okay, that, that's good to hear. P please keep us posted if and when we once again start to bump up against uh, the, the, the national uh, shortages. Um, Dr. Katz, uh, I, I, I know that uh, one positive thing that has come out of the extremely difficult experiences of the spring for our city is that um, we have learned a lot about this disease about how to care for people with COVID-19 um, and, and how to operate a hospital system uh, in the face of, of this pandemic. Could you talk to us about some of the lessons learned um, and about ways, if there are any, that that will advantage us uh, as we hit a second wave? Uh, thank you, uh, council member. Um, yeah, I think there's some very important lessons and I feel like when you go through something horrible, you should at least learn something that would help you in the future. Um, and so we're making a lot of physical changes in the hospital that I think will make a difference regardless of what the future illnesses are. For example, we've discovered that we had a lot of rooms where there was no uh, window or glass door so that the only way you could you know, know what was going on with the patient is to have the door open. Uh, but when you have infectious diseases, you don't want the door open, you want the door closed. And so now we've changed all those rooms out and we've put in glass windows in the wall or a glass door instead of a wood door so that we can see. Um, we're putting into all of our rooms now um, a monitor for sound and video. 
Um, because if you think about the old model of hospitals, patient rings call bell, nurse walks down long hallway to find out what it is that the patient needs, right? And then he or she may have to go back to go get it. So while that's not a very good system regardless, so let's figure out, you know, what the patient needs from the nurse's station so he or she can bring it. Uh, we learned a lot about how to use um, tablets to allow families to talk to one another during the time that we weren't allowed to have visitors. But what we've also learned is, wow, sometimes people, we were allowing visitors, but people's family was across the country. Why can't we do this all of the time? Why can't we always have tablets available so that people can talk to family members? So we've had now family meetings about addressing end of life issues where we include family members who are across the country. I mean, we could have always done that, but somehow it never, it never fully occurred to us. Um, and then in the, in the transferring policy, um, the way we did it the first time learning is we grew ICU everywhere the patients arrived. And when we got too full, we transferred. Uh, we're gonna do it if there is a second wave. Um, and I should say right, right at the moment, we can accommodate several hundred patients without developing any new ICU. Um, but if we, if we do hit that second wave again, what we will do is we will stabilize patients and transfer them before we run out of space in our ICUs so that every hospital will still have available ICU beds so for the patient who came into the emergency department. One of the things that made that transfer so difficult and why even with the state's you know, good attempts to help us, we had challenges is that all of our beds were full and so the patients that needed transfer were all in the emergency room, which made them unstable. Uh, so instead, what we wanna do now is patients come in through the emergency room, we'll stabilize them, bring them to the ICU. If we see that the ICU in that hospital is getting near full, we'll then transfer ICU patients who are on stable vent settings to another hospital thereby always maintaining ICU beds for the patient who is in the emergency department who's so unstable that they can't get into the ambulance. So those for us were the big lessons that would enable us to do a better job in the future. Well, that, that's all encouraging. Um, Dr. Katz, I, I too often hear from people who understand that while the number of cases are increasing in New York City, uh, they have a a misconception that the virus is no longer deadly, that we're only seeing mild cases now. And um, could you clarify for us what you're seeing coming into your hospitals now sure. and the extent to which uh, New Yorkers still need to treat this as a deadly disease? Right. Well, were it not a deadly disease, I wouldn't have lost my father-in-law last month. So we still, we know that this is still a very deadly disease. I mean, we, we always want to be honest and transparent. Things are better in the sense that we are better at caring for sick patients. Um, some of it is um, what we were talking about before, recognizing that intubation is not always the right answer. Some of it is the benefit of the steroids, uh, anticoagulation to prevent clots, rapid dialysis for patients who go into renal failure, no question that we are better and that mortality rates across the country have dropped because of what was learned in New York and the other areas in the beginning. Um, but uh, equally true, um, in uh, New York State, 19 people died yesterday um, due to COVID. So this remains you know, a tremendous risk uh, to people. It is hard, I think, you know, and this may be human nature, most people, it's still true that 80% of people who get infected have zero symptoms at all. And I think that makes it hard for people to understand, but you don't know who's going to be the 1% of people who are gonna die of this disease. Um, and so I think we have to keep making it clear that yes, things are better. And yes, most people who get COVID will be fine, 
Um, but 1% uh, of them are gonna die. Uh, and many people will have long-term side effects, the so-called long haulers who are still struggling to this day from March with neurologic symptoms, with persistent fatigue, shortness of breath, right? Even if you survive, that doesn't mean that this is a easy illness um, to transcend. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, you all set up a, a, a COVID hotline uh, in March, which uh, was a source of information and, uh, for general questions, but also was staffed by clinicians. And I wonder if you could tell us, is that hotline, hotline still up and running? Uh, could, you, could you just describe its operation and staffing at this point and, and, and what kind of calls are coming in? Yeah, uh, it is still running, although we don't run it 24 hours a day anymore. Uh, it, it's not necessary, um, but we still get calls. We still direct people. It always had the advantage that Health and Hospitals has excellent language line capabilities. We can, we can easily connect through our language vendor for over 100 languages. People are still coming right now. The major questions about are where to get tested, you know, how long do I have to quarantine? You know, do I need to be quarantined? Do I need to test? Um, so the, the nature of the questions has changed, but uh, it was clearly one of the critical things that got us through that time because it's not just that the hospitals were overrun, it's that given that the hospitals were full of infected people, imagine how much worse it would have all been if we had sent all of those people, only some of whom had COVID into crowded waiting rooms, right? We would have created our own, you know, uh, multi-infectious events. So uh, that was definitely one of the things that saved us. Absolutely. And finally, just a question for DOHMH, and I guess it would be Assistant Commissioner Kennelly. You're uh, responsible for uh, public messaging uh, DOH has really been in charge of the subway ads and the, the PSAs on TV and all that. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you could tell us the extent to which that campaign is ongoing. Do you have a way of assessing how effective it is? Uh, and maybe a word about kind of multilingual uh, uh, communication so that we reach every sector of the city. Sure. Thank you for your question, Councilmember Levine. Um, yes, we have been running citywide uh, media campaigns uh, since February, um, adjusting our messaging as needed as we learned more about the virus, as um, directives to New Yorkers and guidance changed. Um, our campaigns uh, were designed in terms of our placement to um, saturate the market, and we were given the resources uh, to do so. Um, and uh, we really uh, attempted uh, to uh, ensure that New Yorkers were see receiving these messages on multiple platforms. Um, so TV, streaming, um, uh, streaming platforms like uh, Hulu, um, out of home placement, uh, uh, including bus shelters, subways, um, grocery stores, things like that. And then across all digital and social platforms. Um, in addition, we, uh, we translated all of our materials into 25 languages um, and our media campaigns were available in the top 13 languages. We were on, um, you know, in language uh, TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, really, again, trying to saturate the market and reach as many New Yorkers as possible. The campaigns continue. We've evolved, um, again, as the messaging evolved. Um, we're working closely with our T2 colleagues on messaging around get testing as well. Um, and we will have new messaging um, going into the winter. Uh, we need New Yorkers to continue to adhere to our, the public health guidance. Um, it's what's going to help us move through the next phase um, of the pandemic. Okay. Excellent, thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks, thanks to um, all our panel and um, thanks again to you, uh, Chair Rivera, I'll send it back to you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna acknowledge we've been joined by council member Eugene and I do wanna move on to the, my other colleagues who are here and I see that council member Ayala has a question. 
Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. I mean, this has been great. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate that I'm just so proud of health and hospitals and all of the work um, that, you know, that was done to really control this, uh, this pandemic. And, you know, I'm extremely proud of Metropolitan Hospital that's in my district. Uh, I think that they did a, you know, spectacular job. Um, I was actually there a couple of days ago getting my rapid COVID testing. I had my results in an hour and a half. It was awesome. Um, so I've been encouraging, you know, uh, others to to do the same, to go in um, and get it done. It's very easy, very simple, painless, um, and the results are in within, you know, within a couple of hours. So thank you for that. Um, my concern, however, is really primarily related to the psychiatric beds that were transitioned over to COVID um, beds. I'm not sure what, you know, I haven't been able to get clarity about what that transition looked like, how many beds um were were lost and have we regained those beds now that there's some stability i'll, I'll start uh and i, I want to thank you councilwoman for all your support during that time you sent me a lot of you know encouraging like texts and to to get through and i'll also remind you uh metropolitan had one of the early successes of a woman who was over 90 years old who had been on the ventilator and had gotten off it. Uh, and the, the staff all applauded her. I still remember the image of her leaving the hospital with all these nurses applauding. And it was that kind of thing that got us through those horrible, horrible times. Um, we did uh, lose some beds, although I'll point out that uh, Health and Hospitals, to my knowledge, is, was the only facility anywhere that created a COVID psychiatric ward. Um, we had that at Bellevue um, so that we could, we were the ones accepting when other uh, hospitals said that they couldn't accommodate someone who needed acute hospitalization because they were COVID positive. We took those um, admissions no matter where they came from because we were the only one capable of doing that. And that was stood up, you know, at Bellevue basically in a day. Um, we moved a, a, a lot of things around. Um, and I don't have an exact count, but when this is all done, I think we're gonna have more psych beds than we used to have, uh, in part because other hospitals continue to decrease their investment in psychiatric beds. Psych psychiatry beds do not pay well. You can't make it on Medicaid. You can't break even no matter how efficient you are, it's just not possible. But we'll keep doing it because we have your support and that's we're the mission driven people, thanks to the, the city uh, for providing us the subsidy to enable to do it. But I'll, I'll try to get you exact numbers of where we are. But the, the goal is to be higher when we're all done, not lower. No, I, I really appreciate that because I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, the uh, the mental health of, of the city and, you know, what that's going to look like a year from now, because I think that we're all kind of still um, high on adrenaline and we haven't, you know, really allowed ourselves the opportunity to really process everything that we've been through because we're still kind of in the midst of it. And so I'm really concerned about, you know, uh, the coming year and what that looks like. And I want to ensure that we're prepared to deal with, you know, a mental health uh, crisis, right? Um, because it, they're, they're interrelated. So thank you so much for, you know, all of your work and, you know, you were such a source of inspiration and, and, and help uh, throughout the pandemic, both, you know, personally and professionally. And I thank you for always thank being you. a good human being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, next, we'll be moving to council member Eugene for questions. Time starts now. Council member Eugene here. In, in the meantime, hopefully he'll come back to um, his desk. I just want to, I do want to commend health and hospitals for what you've done for patient patients in need of psychiatric care and that goal of having um, more psych beds for individuals as well as beds for those with COVID 
you are constantly providing uh, a disproportionate amount of psych care even before the COVID-19 pandemic. And I agree as, as other hospitals are closing them, you willing to take that on is a, just a, another testament to your mission. And I, I realize they do not pay well. And, and I wish that more people would, were driven, more institutions were driven by what's most important, which is providing care for people and not providing care for profit. So I do thank you for that always, always, always. Um, Council member Eugene here, because I did want to have him be the last round of questions and then let you all get back to your full-time jobs. Um, all right, well, unfortunately, I guess he just stepped away. I wanna just thank you all for coming in, for answering our questions, uh, for being true public servants, caring so much about New York City. I know Dr. Katz, you didn't know what, what would be before us and, and to you, um, Deputy Executive Director, to you, Commissioner, I, I just wanna thank you for, for all that you did. It really does mean a lot to all of us to know that you're still, um, with us, we can send you the questions that maybe council member Eugene had. And I know that we also discussed um, some of those numbers that I mentioned in terms of how many patients went to the alternative care sites from H and H and anything else my colleagues may have asked, we would appreciate that feedback, um, those responses and just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thanks for supporting us. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for your testimony. At this point, we have concluded administration testimony and we will now be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before beginning your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hand. I'd now like to welcome our first panelist, Jenna Mandel Ritchie. Uh, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Rivera, Chair Torres, and other members of the City Council. My name is Jenna Mandel Ricci. I am representing the Greater New York Hospital Association. GNYHA is proud to support the city's 55 hospitals, serving as a bridge between them and all levels of government during emergency response, including the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic response. GNYHA and our members believe healthcare is a human right and do everything possible to make that a reality. New York's response to the spring COVID-19 patient surge necessitated the largest deployment of healthcare resources in US history. New York's health system bent, but it did not break. In March, to meet the unprecedented volume of patients, hospitals rapidly converted existing beds and created new beds using non-traditional spaces such as lobbies and conference rooms, as well as developing alternate care sites outside of the hospital walls. Hospitals redeployed existing staff and incorporated agency staff. Hospitals also recruited volunteers from the city's medical reserve corps and the state's volunteer portal and used out of state volunteers. Acquiring PPE was challenging given the increased demand and breakdowns in the global supply chain. GNYHA worked with the city, as you've heard, to establish a formal resource request process for hospitals, as well as allocation methodologies for PPE and later ventilators. DOHMH and New York City Emergency Management began weekly supply deliveries, which you just heard about, to every hospital starting the week of March 23rd, and soon after delivered ventilators acquired from state and federal stockpiles. Using day-to-day -day processes as a foundation, hospitals and health systems frequently transferred patients from hospitals experiencing high patient volumes to ones with greater capacity. Now I would like to discuss preparations for future waves. The importance of adherence to public health measures cannot be overstated. 
Maintaining low infection rates is critical to preserving hospital resources. Hospitals are working with the city and state to address micro clusters as they appear in order to blunt a second wave that could coincide with the flu season. Over the summer, New York State issued a regulation requiring all hospitals to develop a 90-day stockpile of PPE. New York City's newly established PPE and ventilator stockpile are an important complement to this effort. With the lessons of the spring surge in mind, hospitals have been improving their surge plans. Hospitals are determined to maintain normal operations while also meeting the needs of COVID-19 patients. Hospitals plan to use phased surge plans, adding beds as needed. GNYHA has been working to advance strategies designed to prevent a single hospital from becoming overwhelmed with patients. The hospital community is also working with the city and state to develop and implement vaccine distribution and implementation plans. Hospitals are fighting for their very survival. Every hospital in New York State will lose money this year. Time's expired. May I continue? Just another moment. Great. Of course. Thank you. GNYHA, like the city and state, is advocating in Washington, D.C. for state and local funding to protect New York's health care system. Without substantial relief, the state may not be able to maintain the $800 million in direct subsidies to safety net hospitals and may be forced to slash the Medicaid budget by 20 to 30 percent. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. New York hospitals will continue their mission, providing the highest quality care when patients are in need and we are proud to help them achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ms. Mendel. I, I, I saw you at the beginning of the hearing, so I think you've been here the whole time, and I wanna thank you for waiting. I asked the question of the administration on PPE distribution the, and the impact on patient utilization um, in June 2020, the committee, this committee on hospitals had a hearing on hospital reopening and during the hearing discussed the impact COVID had on access to care, including vaccinations, dental care and cancer related care. And as of today, what trends are hospitals seeing with respect to outpatient, inpatient and emergency department utilization? So thank you for that question, Chair Rivera. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me and, and um, may perhaps Dr. Katz can weigh in too. We are seeing volumes return, but I don't think they are fully at their pre-COVID levels yet. Um, there is a lot of work being done as all of the hospitals and healthcare systems were reopening to proactively reach out to patients out of great concern that they were not receiving the care that they needed and the preventive care that they needed. So that work is ongoing. I also asked about the how the New York City Emergency Management coordinated medical surge staffing and can you discuss how hospitals coordinated with emergency management on coordinating medical surge staffing and the application process and paperwork? So during the, the COVID patient surge in March and April, hospitals and health systems were trying to access a number, using a number of different strategies to access surge staff. And you heard a little bit about this in my testimony and in the earlier testimony, one way was redeploying staff that they already had. So for example, taking staff from ambulatory care sites or primary care sites, doing the necessary training and redeploying them into the hospitals. There were also contracts with staffing agencies that allowed them to bring staff in. Um, Hospitals did take advantage of the longstanding medical reserve corps that the city health department runs and were able to access staff through that mechanism. New York State stood up a staffing portal. And then of course, because we were at the very beginning of the wave, we had an unbelievable outpouring of support from out of state providers. And that also helped And New York City Emergency Management, huge applause to them and the, the rest of the city for putting together a really robust program that allowed flights and hotel <laughs> that enabled those out of state volunteers to come in and assist. That was an, an enormous help. Um, and the issue of staffing is something that continues and is an area of, of immense focus for all of the hospitals and health systems across the city to ensure that they have the staff that they need if we are to experience a resurgence or second wave. Um, 
So that's an issue that everyone has been very focused on, both the hospitals and health systems and the various agencies. Yeah, it was very much um, all hands on deck at the peak of the pandemic. And I know people who had also been retired or who otherwise had not necessarily been trained in related medicine were called to help. Who was responsible for ensuring that new staff received necessary critical training? Did the city agencies assist you with this or was it up to individual hospitals? So all hospitals must have what are called emergency credentialing processes and procedures. And there's a whole host of work that goes into being prepared for any kind of emergency. And obviously COVID-19 was a very different kind of emergency than folks have experienced previously, but there were already existing processes and procedures to credential staff that normally don't work within the hospital to work within the hospital. And so it's really the human resources departments and other departments within the hospitals that take on that responsibility. And it differs what has to happen based on whether you're a allied health provider, a nurse, a physician, but all of those folks were brought in First of all, there was a whole process to, to understand what their experience and what their licensure and credentials were before being brought in. Then as they were brought in, they had to have all of that verified and checked. They had to be oriented. And then, of course, if you have someone who's not familiar with your operations, there's a supervisory um, sort of structure that's put in place as they're working to make sure that they can work safely and effectively within your institution. In terms of, of patient transfers, I, I asked health and hospitals and, and the administration about an investigation by the Wall Street Journal and the city struggling to receive assistance from the state to set up this centralized hub to implement patient transfers between hospitals. And, and during the pandemic, I did see during one of Governor Cuomo's um, press conferences, representatives from the Greater New York Hospital Association sitting at the dais discussing how we were going to work as one system. And I wanna ask what exactly happened with that centralized hub? How did it assist with patient transfers? And how were those patient transfers used to assist with patient caseload considering the disproportionate impact this pandemic had on our public hospital system throughout the entirety of the last few months? So I think in, in thinking about the, the question of patient transfers, it's important to recognize that, that patient transfers happen day to day within the healthcare system. So whether you're an independent hospital or you're a part of a health system, there are already processes and structures in place so that if you end up with a patient that you can't appropriately care for, given what their condition is and given what services you have at that hospital, there are already day-to-day -day processes. And so as the cases rose in the spring, hospitals relied upon those day-to-day -day processes. So independent hospitals already have sort of routine transfer partners that they work with. And then you heard Dr. Katz, for example, talk about within the, the New York City public hospital system, how transfers occurred. That happened in all of the large health systems within the city, whether it was New York Presbyterian, Northwell, as we saw surges in cases in Queens and many all of the hospitals located in Queens became very full of patients. So there was constant efforts to try and relieve that pressure on those hospitals in order to provide high quality care to those patients, as well as ensure that those hospitals were ready to receive any new patients that were coming in. So that was going on as a backdrop. And then as issues arose, we did play a role because we have strong working relationships with all of the health systems and all of the hospitals in the city. So for example, that we had a very unique relationship with the Veterans Administration, which allowed us to place small numbers of patients each day into some of their hospitals. So we actually worked as the clearinghouse and used existing data sources to understand which of our hospitals may need that relief valve. And we actually worked through those transfers with the hospital that needs to send patients and the VA hospitals that were ready to accept them. We also worked closely um, with colleagues at the State Department of Health to be looking at the numbers, understand who needed to go in. There was a lot of data that went into how um, 
what hospitals were being approached about transfers for us to understand what hospitals were likely going to need to transfer. And also, as you heard, I believe um, either Dr. Katz or Commissioner Criswell talk about many of the Department of Defense providers were actually pushed into hospitals based on where the need was greatest. I hope that answers part, at least part of your question. Um, sure. I, I do know the Department of Defense was certainly involved. Um, and again, we receive assistance from across the country, which we are eternally grateful for. And we have we have tried to repay that debt as, as well as we could. I guess what I want to know is that, you know, our city's public hospital system, other safety net hospitals serve a majority of the city's uninsured and underinsured population. And many of their sites are located in the communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic. And the New York Times reported that these hospitals could have benefited from additional resources as they were clearly caring for some of the patients that were most in need during this time. So did the administration prioritize ensuring our, our public hospitals and safety net hospitals received the PPE and equipment they needed? And I guess what I mean by the administration is also kind of in your capacity, the Greater New York Hospital Association coordination. How did voluntary hospitals provide assistance to our public hospitals, particularly those disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and I'll give you an example. Did voluntary hospitals assist with patient transfers, taking on more patients from safety net and public hospitals? And what about the additional staff that, that we mentioned briefly? So I, I think it's important to recognize that during the surge, all, all of the hospitals across the city, they, they weren't all impacted equally, but hospitals, everywhere were managing incredible volumes of patients that had never been seen before. And um, I, we, what we did, and we just like throughout the response, we worked very, very hard to make sure that all of our members, which includes all of the h, &H facilities, as well as all of the other hospitals within New York City, we were doing our best to ensure that they all had what they needed in order to meet the needs of the patients that were, were within their doors. And they were all struggling. Every hospital was struggling to keep up with the demand. So, so I think the PPE example is great. We really feel so proud of the work that we did with Jackie Bray at City Hall and with Dave Starr and his team at the City Health Department and h, &H to make sure that every hospital got the PPE that it needed to make sure that the ventilators were allocated as, as well. Um, you know, I, I can't speak, there was so much going on. I can't speak directly to which hospital helped which other hospital. I do know that there is a, there is and was very much a spirit of collaboration. I know that neighbors help neighbors. So while you may be part of a health system, if you're located next door to Elmhurst and you're a Mount Sinai facility, you just help each other out because that's what neighbors do. So I think there was a lot of folks calling folks that they knew and, oh, we're, we need a, a, a tiny bit more of this to get us through until the next weekly delivery. So I think there was a lot of that going on. And again, I think with patient transfers, because it is very complex, as Dr. Katz alluded to, generally those transfers happen within a health system because there are electronic health records, there are provider relationships, there are ambulance contracts, all of that that make it much easier easier and more efficient to transfer within a health system, but that doesn't mean that transfers didn't happen across health systems. They just, I don't believe it happened at, the, at, at high numbers. Um, but I do think there was absolutely a spirit of collaboration um, amongst all of the hospitals. And frankly, all of the hospitals were doing their best to manage the crush of patients that they were, that they were working to serve. Well, thank you for your answer. I think we're going to hear from some advocates, um, policy experts, as well as potentially some of the amazing staff that were inside of these hospitals witnessing um, this collaboration. So I'm interested in getting their feedback. And I encourage you and, and everyone who is here from the administration to stay and hear some of what I think will be very, very honest feedback and real solutions of, of how we can, of course, do better and, and prepare for anything coming our way. So with that, I just, yes, I wanna thank you, um, 
for your testimony. Um, I think that's it for my questions. I don't think I see any of my colleagues here to ask anything. Um, so with that, I'll let you go and move on to Thank some you. of my uh, friends and allies. Thank you for your testimony. We will now be moving on to our next public panel. In order of speaking, we will have Elizabeth Benjamin, followed by Christopher Schuler, followed by Anthony Feliciano. Elizabeth Benjamin, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I wanna first of all, thank the city council for having this important hearing. Um, the Community Service Society is 175, and, and actually specifically you, Councilwoman Rivera, Rivera for hanging in there as the, as the only one left standing. Um, I really wanna, you know, Community Service Society is a 175 year old organization that works on improving the lives of working people. Um, I really want to start out my testimony by saluting health and hospitals and the private and voluntary system and all the healthcare workers that work in these facilities. This has been a very tough time for folks. Um, and, you know, their work and their sacrifice is so, you know, you know, we, we so appreciate that on, you know, on behalf of all New Yorkers. And I just can't overstate that enough. So thank you all. Um, I, I really wanted to go into the question of that, how uh, COVID has a disparate impact on people of color. I think that was a line of questioning that was really important that you invest started, uh, Councilwoman Rivera. And I, and I just wanna emphasize that we know in New York City, COVID has had a twice as harsh impact on people of color in terms of morbidity and mortality around the state. It's four times um, disparate impact on people of color. And that is related to, you know, who are essential workers social determinants of health, such as quality of housing, type of housing, doubling up, um, insurance, the ability to access insurance, food security. And, but what I really wanna focus my testimony on is not these social determinants of health because you know these disparities are, are social constructions, but social constructions are the result of concrete policy decisions. And New York State has made a series of policy decisions that have resulted in really unfair allocation of healthcare resources um, that have in fact exacerbated the disparities of the COVID pandemic. Um, so in New York state 20 years ago had 75,000 beds. Now we have 50, there are 25,000 missing beds. Where are the missing beds? Let's just look at Queens. Around Elmhurst, there are four closed hospitals. And so of course Elmhurst really got you know, overwhelmed. And quite frankly, we have 6.4 beds per thousand people in Manhattan, and yet we only have 1.5 beds per thousand people in Queens. Similar disparities are experienced in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. And what's happening with COVID? Well, there's 34, 000, 34 cases per thousand in Queens and only 21 case, uh, cases per thousand in Manhattan. So there's no greater health need in Manhattan. There's only greater health resources in Manhattan. And these resource allocations are by design. And the design started in the 90s when we deregulated our hospital rate setting system. So we went from I'm having- sorry. Time's up. Sorry? Please, please, please continue. Okay. We, 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 we do have a timer, but I want you to complete your testimony. Um, I think I got two more minutes, if that's okay. That's- I'll be, I'll be fast. That's, please, okay. absolutely. So there, we deregulated our- uh, so, Financing decisions are like this. We deregulated our hospital rate setting system, which protected and resourced our safety net hospitals. We eliminated and essentially eviscerated any kind of health planning that was done on a regional basis through our health system agencies. And now we have a private and voluntary dominated hospital planning council and health planning council that basically rubber stance, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions of wealthy institutions and closures of poor ones. And then finally, we wasted about an excess of 13 billions in our indigent care, care pool over the last 20 years. It was spent on rich hospitals and not targeted to our safety net hospitals like our very own beloved health and hospital system in New York City. The last thing I wanna say on financing is that the CARES Act made this all much worse. Um, the CARES Act, health and hospitals basically got about $100 million so far 
per hospital. New York Presbyterian got $631 million. So that's a six to one disparity, rich hospital over poor hospital. NYU, $427 million. Mount Sinai, $200 million. I don't know what they did wrong. Anyway, so they only have a two to one disparity over health and hospitals. Um, and then the nonprofit hospitals in our city are, you know, basically go around suing people. They're suing 6,000 people right now. They are not behaving like charities. Some of them charge 9% interest, which is a you know, commercial interest rate, not a charitable interest rate, which in fact they get when they get loans um, so from the government. So there's some real problems. We have some solutions. One, one solution is your very own bill, Councilwoman Rivera, intro 1674, which would establish a hospital patient advocate. Maybe we could get some answers like how many COVID patients were handled by hospitals? How would that sign up with the line up with how much that CARES Act funding was allocated? I think that's the most important question this body could get the answer to. Um, the second thing is, is that maybe we, it's time to start investigating, you know, property tax exemptions, or maybe we should like right size it so that we give more property tax exemptions to safety net hospitals and a little less tax exemption to the super rich hospitals that could maybe afford to actually pay some taxes. Uh, or zoning questions. Why do we need a 40 floor tower in, for Lenox Hill, for North Shore, to have North Well to have uh, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan where we clearly don't need more hospital beds? Um, why not put that 40 floor tower around Queens, in Queens, somewhere in Queens? I mean, I think there's you know four missing hospitals. There's certainly a need for more beds in Queens should we have more pandemics in the future. Um, and then finally, I think we really need to resource community groups to be able to help patients who are being pursued very aggressively by these hospitals and other providers for medical debt. Um, our medical debt burden in New York City is quite large. There are, health, there are racial disparities in who owns, medical, who owns medical debt. And I think we really need to resource groups to help those folks. And I'm going to stop there because I went way over time. And I apologize to the Sergeant of Arms for doing so. It's okay. We're 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 gonna. I'm gonna ask a question after this panel, and um, for for you particularly. Yes, we do have a timer, but I never want anyone to think that they cannot finish uh, their thought or, or or the important points that they want to make. Um, so to to the next panelist, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll be hearing from Christopher Schuler. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. <laughs> People with disabilities, which include people of all ages, races, genders, sexual orientations, and socioeconomic backgrounds, are among the most threatened by COVID-19. With city cases on a downward trajectory, at least for now, this is the time to correct mistakes made earlier this year and to improve the care given to people with disabilities uh, before a potentially devastating second wave hits. Good, 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 good morning, Chair Rivera uh, and members of the committee. I slipped that in just before noon. Um, my name is Christopher Schuyler. I'm a, a senior staff attorney for, 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 for New York Lawyers for the Public Interest within the, 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 the Disability Justice Program. Um, I'm a person who stutters. Um, I also want to I want to draw attention to and, and thank that, 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 that Dr. Katz and his team for, 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 for their leadership during during this very challenging time. Um, I'm part of NOPI is part of a coalition of advocates um, and stakeholders who work closely with, with Dr. Katz, and we appreciate all this leadership. Um, my testimony today will, will will cover issues that people with disabilities have faced at city hospitals during during the COVID. Uh, 19 pandemic, um, as well as recommendations to improve care to deliver to people with disabilities going forward. Approximately 1 million New Yorkers self-identify as people with disabilities. While, while disability alone may not increase the threat of COVID-19, though emerging research suggests otherwise, many, many with disabilities also have underlying conditions which are known to increase the risk of contracting COVID-19. In fact, adults with disabilities are three times more likely uh, than, than those without disabilities that have heart disease, stroke, diabetes, or cancer. Th these statistics are even more troubling for, for, for Black people since 14% of working age 
uh, African Americans have a disability compared with 11% of non Hispanic white people. Moreover, this virus generally has been most devastating to people belonging to racial minorities as Latino and African Americans are three times more likely to become infected than white people. Um, New York State hospitals anticipate losing 25 billion through April of 2021. Hospitals should be exempt from budget cuts. Um, public city hospitals are, are already struggling as has been testified earlier today, but much more so than, than their private counterparts. Uh, and they bear most of the weight of caring for the poor and working class New Yorkers. <laughs> Critically, the hosp hospital services that should be most protected are those supporting the most vulnerable uh, populations, including people with disabilities. Um, time. I see my time is is up, and I'm I am uh, I apologize for that. I'll, I'll try to breeze through through some of my main points um, and hit my recommendations at the at the bottom of my document. And for anybody, um, I'll submit my 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 written testimony, which which you'll be able to you'll be able to look in more detail um, at what I have to say here. So um, issues affecting people with disabilities seeking, seeking medical, medical care at city hospitals during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the, the threat of rationing medical care for people with disabilities. Um, at the peak of the first wave, medical uh, resource scarcity was a significant concern. Other parts of the world had already begun medical rationing and for people with disabilities who often need higher levels of care than people without disabilities, uh, the concern was, was that medical providers would make determinations for care, uh, to take care for others less needy than them. Um, to aid medical providers in, in making such determinations, New York needs clear and expansive crisis standards of care, um, a CSC. Currently, New York's CSC, which was enacted in 2015, covers only the narrow issue, issue of ventilator allocation and does so in, in a way that's deeply troubling for people with disabilities. Incredibly, the existing ventilator guidelines indicate that people with disabilities using a ventilator in everyday life could, uh, when seeking acute care services during a scarcity crisis, have their ventilator removed and given to a person with a higher likelihood of survival. The, 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 the ventilators, of course, are not the only form of essential care and New York also needs to pass guidelines that assure people with disabilities that they will receive equal access to other respiratory therapies, medications, critical care beds, uh, and staff during, during a crisis. Currently, medical providers are without uniform guidance in these matters and are left to, in the unenviable position of making case-by-case -case determinations. While these determinations are, supposed, are supposedly neutral and data-driven and intended to produce objective, unbiased medical decisions, uh, in practice, subjectivity based on bias and misinformation about the quality of life of people with disabilities plays a significant role. New York was fortunate to avoid uh, a ventilator rationing crisis during the first wave. However, we should not take chances. Uh, now, before the next wave, is the time to pass updated guidelines concerning ventilator usage as well as other types of central care. Um, I want to say a few words about restrictive visitor policies. Um, so in, in, in the effort to control the spread of COVID-19 this past spring, city hospitals instituted strict no visitor policies. These policies in some cases negatively impacted people with disabilities who often rely on family members, interpreters, and designated caregivers to aid in their effective communication with medical providers. Without the assistance of visitors, many people with disabilities, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, were unable to make informed medical decisions and were thus denied equal access to care. The, the visitor policies need to be reconsidered with input from stakeholder communities to ensure that people with disabilities are not denied uh, equal access to medical care if visitor restrictions again become necessary to control the spread of COVID-19. Um, there, there, uh, there are issues concerning inadequate communication with people who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind, as well as those needing language access assistance. Um, so during the first wave, uh, hospitals overwhelmed by the crisis often failed to provide access to American Sign Language interpreters and, and video remote interpretation. Um, to make matters worse, masks without see-through plastic portions make lip reading impossible. These, these challenges cannot be uh, use a justification for a lower level of medical care. Um, 
Hospitals need to address these shortcomings now and, and to uh, improve their processes for dealing with them in the future. Um, there's also a need for um, exceptions to, to, to universal mask wearing policies. Uh, while universal mask wearing policies are, are the prevailing method of controlling spread of COVID-19, certain people with disabilities either cannot wear masks for long periods of time or at all. The, the, the disability laws require um, uh, ensure equal access of healthcare services and when necessary to provide accommodations, even for people with disabilities for, uh, requiring conflicting accommodations. Um, I have just, I just one, uh, I just have one, one, one last um, kind of issue I want to bring to light, and then I will, um, I'll, I'll list our, our, our recommendations for improved care. Um, so there, the last issue is um, the inaccessibility of telemedicine for, for certain people with disabilities. Telemedicine um, is an example of necessity driving innovation uh, and, and is a valuable tool in the effort to control the spread of COVID-19. So telemedicine uh, experienced exponential growth since earlier this year. However, certain people with disabilities are unable to benefit from this healthcare option. Uh, a large percentage of people with disabilities live below the, the poverty line without baseline technology devices and broadband internet. The platform is not useful. Also, certain people with disabilities may not possess the level of technologic, uh, technology literacy necessary to util utilize telemedicine. Additionally, people with disabilities with communication impairments may not uh, be able to use tel uh, the technology without the assistance of an interpreter on hand. L l l lastly, the, the lack of in-person connection between medical providers and people with disabilities risks the delivery of a lower level of care. Uh, our, our recommendations um, are, uh, we encourage um, uh, that the New York State Legislature, or we would like the, the, the New York City Council to encourage the New York State Leg Legislature to revise its crisis standards of care pertaining to ventilator rationing, uh, rationing, clarifying that people with disabilities currently using ventilators uh, will not be taken off their ventilators when seeking acute care. Additionally, to broaden um, the CSC to assure people with disabilities that they will receive equal access to respiratory therapies, medications, critical care beds, and staff during times of resource scarcity. Um, we also uh, would encourage the revision of city hospital visitor restriction guidelines with input from disability community stakeholders to ensure the rights of people with disabilities um, to equal access of medical care. Uh, we'd like uh, the training of medical, of medical providers at city hospitals mandated um, to recognize implicit bias as it pertains to, to people with disabilities. Unacknowledged bias has been demonstrated to contribute to worse health outcomes for people with disabilities. Uh, we also would like uh, to encourage the city council to um, encourage the, the New York State Legislature to, to repeal Article 30D of the Public Health Law, also known as the Emergency or Disaster Treatment Protection Act, which offers broad protections to hospitals and their executive leadership from civil liability arising from certain acts or omissions resulting in harm during the COVID-19 pandemic, that thereby lessening patients and family members of their rights to hold hospitals accountable. Um, and lastly, uh, we just we would like um, uh, uh, to recommend um, appropriate funding be allocated. Um, and resources to improving telehealth experience for people with disabilities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about these key issues, which have negatively impacted uh, access to medical care for people with disabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please feel free to discuss me further, uh, discuss with me further. And um, I appreciate you, you, you giving me a few extra minutes uh, to, to, get, to get those recommendations out. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I know um, I have legislation intro uh, 2017, which will call for clarity and communication on visitation policies to ensure equal access to care, which is just one small point that you made. So I appreciate your testimony. And uh, Harbani, I know we have someone else um, on the panel. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Anthony Feliciano to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera and, and committee staffers. Um, I'm Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. Um, it's often said that what gets measured gets done. 
but the opposite is also true. Um, what also gets prioritized or value for measuring successful effective response can be ignored and sustained inequities. And I've said this many times in many other committee hearings. And part of my testimony talks a lot about what Elizabeth um, addressed, so I'm not going to go through that, um, but they're critically important. What I want to go into is we know that the city has limitations on their role or jurisdiction over hospitals. Obviously, that's the primary responsibility of the state. However, they're, I think they're following things that the city can address to strengthen some three, three fundamental elements of a pandemic. Uh, which is preparedness, prevention, detention, and, and response, actually four. Um, and I want to address some clear parts of this. Um, I think we need to develop a comprehensive public health plan around COVID responses that will address problems of cultural competency, equity, and, and institutional oversight. This will include preparedness around capacity assessments and pair them with strategies to promote readiness and implementation. The objective was to really to generate some community mitigation guidelines and pandemic response triggers so that local policymakers and community-based organizations and leaders have a roadmap for early targeted and coordinated implementation of surveillance, not medical interventions, holistic and mutual aid approaches, and, and measures to reinforce medical and public health capacities. I also believe that we need to establish enforcing pandemic readiness standards for hospitals and health systems and ensure that these institutions respect and promote health equity. Um, I also believe we have to make standards practice to collect and share data on the risks of Pacific communities, most notably Black communities, Latinx communities, and other marginalized communities, people with disabilities, Native Americans, elderly, and this critical influence. I think we have to craft these strategies and programs and budgets and plans for targeted public health investment that increase the resilience of marginalized communities. Um, efforts cost money. And relative to economic and health risk, we need to adopt an equity assessment with the city budget on what is provided to support to hospitals and hopefully expand that to every part of the city budget process. And part of that to me leads to, we need to have racially, racially equitable policies and budget decisions should be defined as, they, as a result in equitable inequitable outcomes by race, regardless of any indication of racial bias, integrate explicit consideration of racial equity into every consideration of New York State and New York City government budgets. Um, I think also we need to ensure that the Board of Health declares racism right. as a public health crisis. Last time the Board of Health met was in September, and they should pick up the, the ball again on that referendum. I think we have to vigorously exercise the jurisdiction of the commissioner of the New York State Department of Health for controlling the COVID pandemic. Along with New York, along with New York docs, um, we seek some partnership leadership around that and think a broader um, thinking around that. Um, pending the governor um, signing the Rivera bill um, and the Godfrey bill to ensure that contact tracing data is not shared, we think the city should prepare for its own legislation around that. I think we need to develop some resources around health impact assessment tools, similar to California, but a little bit much broader, looking at best per thousand and other hospital metrics. I think we need to create some COVID clinics, like the creation of the World Trade Center clinics, and expand the idea of the center of excellence model that um, Health and Health is looking into around COVID clinics. Those who survive COVID are still susceptible and have differential health outcomes and treatment. They are showing cardiac, renal, and respiratory complication events, after no longer having COVID. And they should, this should have a direct link to research and development of common practices and standards of care. Also, I wanna ensure that PPA applications require training and annual updates, um, similar to what we're doing with Ebola. Just one part that I think the city needs to be really vocal in protecting New York City Hospital and other safety net facilities to the state. Um, we have to shift test and tracing of it back to New York City Department of Health New York Health and Health is already financially burdened and added pressure and responsibility without any access to more funding that's gonna create more of a burden. We have to shift away from Optum as the contractor for COVID-19 test and trace, informatics and operations. I think we still need to re go back to resource and shifting the resource from the police department to more public health and investments in our public health and social network. It truly was not done. Um, instead, it was a shell game by the mayor. and. Um, Part of it, we have to do equity around charity care that um, Elizabeth mentioned around the Indian care pool. Those formulas needs to be changed and 
more is um, the switch to the safety net. I think we need to call for more return hospital closures and service reductions um, as a city to the state. Passage of the New York Health Act, which I know is a long road ahead. Um, but I think developing purchasing pools based on local need and not institutional interest and competition is critically important. Uh, maybe looking into a diagnostic code specifically for COVID-19, uh, Medicare diagnostic code. Um, need for minimum safety standards and ratio that the state has not done properly. Um, and definitely coordinate uh, uh, proper distribution of PPA to, PPE to staff. So I think this needs a real holistic and broad approach. And while the city may not have full powers over the, the um, hospitals, there's plenty of, of, of advocacy and creative thinking that should be done. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we'll now hear from Judith Kutchin. Uh, you may begin your testimony. Time Hi. starts now. Hi, thank you, um, Chair Rivera and committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Judith Kutchin and I'm a health and hospital nurse at Woodhall Hospital. And I'm the president of the New York City h, &H Mayoral Executive Council representing 9,000 registered nurses. The COVID-19 emergency severely affected hospitals throughout the state, but New York City area hospitals was especially hit hard. In New York City, during the height of the surge, in March and April, daily hospitalizations averaged more than 12,000, including more than 3,000 ICU level patients. Based on the experience of NISNA nurses, we believe that there are some weaknesses in our hospitals that need to be addressed if we are to be ready for the next COVID-19 surge. First, it is clear that staffing was a big problem, both at h, h and in the private sector hospitals. At h, h and many of the safety net private hospitals, nurse staffing has chronically been worse than it has in the large hospital networks. During the COVID surge in March and April, the situation got much worse. In the ICUs, there was supposed to be no more than two patients for each nurse, but we saw nurses getting four or six and as many as eight patients at a time. This is unacceptable and it impacted the health and safety of the nurses and the patients. We also noted that the staffing was unequal between hospitals. In some hospitals, nurses had a patient assignment of one to four, one to five, while others had seven, one to seven or one to eight for the same level of acuity. We need to implement uniform standards so that every patient gets equal levels of quality care. This is especially important to address racial and economic inequality that affects outcomes. We saw that the impact of COVID was much worse for Black and Latino patients who had higher mortality and hospitalization rates. Inequality in the level of staffing and hospital care has lethal consequences. As the second surge approaches, it is imperative that the city of New York take action to ensure that there are enough staff and that they are properly trained to meet patient care needs. Second, we need to put in place consistent infection control and PPE policies to protect nurses and patients. During the surge, there were different standards and policies coming from the CDC, the state and city DOH and hospital management. It is important that we have uniform standards of infection control and PPE to make sure that nurses and other staff are safe and that the patients get the care they need. This means that we need to have infection control based on science and clinical standards and not based on the need to ration PPE. In addition, nurses and other direct care providers must be involved in the design and implementation of such wow. uniform policies and protocols. Third, we have to address the racial and social inequalities in our hospitals. Black and Latino communities have suffered worse health outcomes and had led access to care, less access to care for a long, long time. COVID made that situation even worse. The racial inequalities in our economic and healthcare system must be fully recognized and the city must take steps to address these factors before the next COVID surge. Fourth, 
we have to take steps to prevent hospitals from closing services or units on the basis of profit motives. There's a trend of private sector hospitals closing unprofitable units to replace them with surgical and specialty service that make more money. Psychiatric beds have been a particular problem at New York Presby and other hospitals have been closing psych beds for entire units. During COVID, they were able to speed this process up by using the emergency to convert these units to COVID beds. Those site beds need to be kept open because there is definitely a need for them. The city of New York must take action to protect these vital services before the next COVID surge leads to yet more closures. Finally, we believe that steps must be taken to provide support to h and and the private sector safety net hospitals. These hospitals are already under financial pressure and COVID has made it worse. The city has to maintain the support of h and and look to expand support for private safety nets. We cannot allow the budget crisis to result in closures or reductions of services provided by safety net hospitals. COVID has not gone away. And if we are to be fully prepared, we need to address the acute problems in our hospital system. Thanks again for allowing me to testify today. Thank you all for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it over to Chair Rivera for questions. Thank you so much. I, I do have a, a few questions for the panel, I guess, um, a specific ones for, for each of you, but, you know, of course, feel free to, to, to chime in. I guess I'll start with Ms. Benjamin. What recent changes, if any, have happened on the state level to charity care funding? And was it enough? Well, yes, <laughs> we actually did win a major victory in March which is it used to, they used to allocate the, the $1.2 billion indigent care pool based on an old protocol, uh, an old formula that allowed the hospitals to, to get, draw down indigent care pool funding for their bad debt. But bad debt could be for bad debt for rich people or poor people instead of allocating it 100% on the volume of services provided to uninsured and Medicaid patients. So we finally closed, it was about a 15% loophole that one has finally been closed. Nonetheless, I would submit we still don't go far enough. Every other state in the country only allocates these, what's the indigent care, their version of the indigent care pool funding, which is funded by a federal stream of money called the disproportionate share hospital funds. Every other state, including California, where Do Dr. Katz came from. In fact, he was, as he told me, he was flabbergasted. We don't do it that way. Every other state just targets that funding to true safety net hospitals. In New York, we're an anom anomaly. We pass it out like it's, we spread it around like peanut butter. Every hospital gets a little bit of this funding, whether they serve poor people or not, whether they offer financial assistance or not, whether they sue their patients or not. So that's wrong. We should actually, you know, we don't have so much money in our healthcare system to be wasting precious indigent care pool fundings on the likes of, you know, very rich hospitals like New York Presbyterian. I mean, they really don't need it. Why are we, why are we spending $60 million a year of these precious funds on them when we could shore up hospitals that are going to close? Or as Nurse Cutchin says, does, don't even have enough PPE or staffing to, to serve needy patients. That's, you know, we need to, time. the reckoning time is now. And the indigent care pool funding really should be rethought Hospital rate settings should be rethought. Global budgeting like Maryland is another great option we should be exploring. Obviously adopting a single payer healthcare proposal is another you know, way we could, you know, avenue we could go, which would be great in terms of allocating our resources more fairly. But this system of incredible inequity has to stop. Thank you so much. Um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, we, I touched in my opening remarks on just a very, very problematic formula for how we distribute these dollars to our healthcare system. And, and I would hope that the pandemic was just one more reminder, an urgent, tragic reminder of how this is hurting our poorest New Yorkers in our communities of color. And, well, and, and I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, just one other thing. I think this year, because 
the very rich hospitals benefited so wildly from the CARES Act funding compared to the safety net hospitals, maybe this is the year to say, okay, we're not going to pass out the indigent care pool on even the Medicaid and uninsured formula because the rich hospitals do do a volume of Medicaid services. Maybe we should only be spending the indigent care pool money on the hospitals that are about to go under, first of all, but also that serve needy communities, you know, high need communities, communities of color. Um, you know, I think we could, this is a moment where we might need to be a little more creative since there really have been some major winners and losers with the CARES Act funding. I, you know, we, we all work really hard as advocates to just get in the enhanced le um, safety net legislation through in order to meet some part of the formula, but there's still so much distortion. Um, and we have to be clear, safety net hospitals are really, uh, Black and brown communities rely on safety net facilities. If you don't give them equally, it is a racist act in the same way because of the budget distribution of that. And that there should be a tier approach, particularly with hospitals who have, some may have offshore accounts and have money in, uh, in other places and that should be all addressed in around the charity care and any distribution of funding that goes into the system. Thank you. I, I, I agree with that. I, I wanted to ask, um, I asked this question of Greater New York, and I wanted to ask you specifically, um, Ms. Kutchen, if that's okay. What I said in earlier in the, in the line of questioning was at the peak of the pandemic, we know it was all hands on deck, understood. And you all representing the nurses, you know, we have a long, long fight on safe staffing, on making sure that you had the resources you need even pre-pandemic. But during COVID-19, when it was indeed an all hands on deck situation, people who had been retired or had otherwise had not been trained in related medicine were called to help because we were so short staffed. Who was responsible, and, and, and I just wanna underline, some of that redeployment of, an, of inexperienced staff uh, was sent to inpatient and ICUs. And so I want to ask, you know, how was that process for you, your members, your colleagues? Who was responsible for ensuring that new staff received necessary clinical training? Uh, did the agencies or the Greater New York or some of these institutions assist you with this? Or was it up to the individualized hospitals to provide this training uh, amidst everything else going on? So I believe it was up to the individual hospitals. Uh, most of the training was um, based on the education um, department's um, recommendations. The training was swift in a lot of cases. Um, uh, you know, the members were very worried about patient care. They were worried that they, they were going to harm a patient because they wasn't adequate, adequately trained. I do um, applaud h, h for all the efforts, but however, we are going into a next surge and we have to assure that people are properly trained and not having elbow to elbow training, not having last minute training to say, okay, well, one day trainers, lives are at stake, as, as, as it was said over and over again, these are black and brown patients in vulnerable communities, underserved communities, and we want to assure that equality, that everybody get the same appropriate care. So education has to be on the front line. Training has to be first. Training has to be real strict on caring for COVID patients to prevent the spread of COVID, which is our goal. Thank you very, very much. Um, you know, I agree that clearly we had lessons learned. We tried our best um, considering all the circumstances, but the inequity was there. I, I think just, uh, Ms. Benjamin, in, in some of those statistics that you gave, 6.4 beds per 1,000 people in Manhattan versus 1 1.5 per 1,000 people in Queens. You don't necessarily have to be a policy expert to realize how very, very troubling that is. So I don't know if there was anything else that the panel wanted to add. You know, I look to you all repeatedly when I'm doing this work. Your guidance, your advice, um, your expertise has been absolutely invaluable to kind of my journey on this hospitals committee, trying to support our health and hospital system and all hospitals citywide. If there was anything you wanted to add uh, before I, I adjourn this hearing, I, I do welcome any comments or anything else. 
I just want to add, and I didn't mention it before, it's been always an uphill battle um, through every Medicaid waiver and the latest one, DISHRIP, that there's no consistency standard or way of looking at uh, community engagement and outreach in a more equitable way. It seems to be very sporadic, episodic, and, resp and, and, and response oriented, not proactive. And so uh, this happened with the with same thing with COVID. I commend Health and Hustle for contracting for navigators and um, community engagement, but they can broaden that uh, expansion. I think the other part is that we have to be really serious and clear to each other that they are political influences and, and issues that play out in justifying inequities and we seem to skirt around it um, out of either fear that we don't wanna have a safe space for each other or not being brave enough. Either one is still problematic for uh, black and indigenous people of color and immigrant communities. Hmm. Agreed. I know we have a, a long way to go, um, and we've been talking about equity and access to health care for a long time for our neighbors with disabilities, just historically marginalized. Um, I know we do have a long way to go, and we still are in this pandemic, so I want to thank you all for... Christopher, did you want to add something? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted just wanted to kind of um, add my voice to 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 the choir of of what Anthony was just saying too. Just um, kind of really, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure how to uh, how to better encourage kind of um, uh, you know, hospitals to to uh, initiate conversations with stakeholders, uh, but 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 we're here. We're, we're all, you know we're always kind of we have the energy and we're always looking to kind of um, you know help influence and educate on, on policy decisions. Um, and you know I, I mentioned in the beginning of my testimony that that um, that that, that Nopi is um, is is a member of a coalition of advocates. Um, who are, are who are fighting for uh, medical access for people with disabilities, and uh, Dr. Katz has been kind of instrumental and in, um, you know in kind of uh, partnering up with us. Um, but you know the other hospitals around the city, it's kind of it seems like it seems like we only um, really engage in a dialogue if we're if we're planning to file a lawsuit, um, and you know it would be it would be kind of much it'd be much nicer if, uh, if it were more proactive rather than than re reactive all the time so that's it thank you i appreciate that i did i did uh let the administration and greater new york hospital association know that there would be honest candid feedback in this hearing and i and i expect that every time that's why i convene these and i do hope that we can all come together is in some way to talk about what's next and how we can be collaborative and as proactive as possible considering all of the circumstances. I think we wanted to do one last call for anyone else who wanted to testify, but I wanted to thank you all. I wanted to thank the essential workers, the, the frontline staff, to the New York, to, to the Nurses Association. Thank you for testifying. Thank you for following up with me, uh, for always being there and for rallying for taking care of the staff, but also the patients as well. That's what we want to do is make sure that people feel like in a city as wealthy as New York, that people have access to the best care, regardless of where you live or who you love or where you came from. So I want to thank you, this amazing panel who is quite brilliant and see if there's anyone else who would like to testify. Thank you, Chair. At this point, um, if we can ask if we inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and has yet to be called. Please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, not seeing any hands. I'll turn it back to Chair Rivera to adjourn the Thank you all again. I think we all share the fundamental belief that healthcare is a human right. And I'm looking forward to working with you to make sure that we can deliver that for every New Yorker. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you to all the council staff that continues to make this happen.